Hello, I'm Joseph Pierce, writer in residence and associate professor of literature at Ave Maria University in Florida, and author of Tolkien Man and Myth and editor of Tolkien A Celebration. Welcome to Catholic Courses and our lecture series on the hidden meaning of the Lord of the Rings. Over the next eight lectures, we'll be looking at the Lord of the Rings, beginning with the life and beliefs of the author itself, J.R.R. Tolkien. That will be the main subject of this first lecture. Lecture two will look at the true myth, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and the truth of fiction, looking at the philosophy of myth, which underpins the fiction uh, and the whole idea of creativity that animates the works of both J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And we'll also be looking at the influence of Tolkien on C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity. In Lecture 3, The Meaning of the Ring, To Rule Them All and In the Darkness and Bind Them, we'll look at the symbolism of the ring itself, the one ring to rule them all and in the darkness bind them, and find out how that symbolism is crucial to an understanding of the Lord of the Rings. In Lecture 4, of Elves and Men, Fighting the Long Defeat, we'll be looking at the importance of death and immortality as concepts and as realities in the Lord of the Rings. In Lecture 5, seeing ourselves in the story, Boromir, Faramir and Gollum as everyman figures, we're looking at how art is a mirror of life and how the Lord of the Rings presents to us an image of ourselves, an image of humanity, as we see in the characters of Boromir and Faramir, Gollum, Frodo, Samwise Gamgee, how these characters reflect back to us, if you like, our true selves, who we are as human beings. In Lecture 6, of wizards and kings, Gandalf and Aragorn as figures of Christ, we'll look at the way that Tolkien introduces Christ figures into the story with a subtlety that you know, belies it being called a simple allegory. And we'll see how Gandalf and Aragorn and Frodo all emerge as figures of Christ. In Lecture 7, Beyond the Power of the Ring, The Riddle of Tom Bombadil, we'll look at some of the lesser known characters, not least of all is Tom Bombadil, who was left out of Peter Jackson's film adaptation of The Lord of the Rings, but is nonetheless a very important ingredient, a very important part of Tolkien's myth, Tolkien's epic, The Lord of the Rings. We'll also look at some of the other unsung heroes, if you, if you like, lesser known characters such as Treebeard and some of the other characters, Denethor and Theoden, in Lecture 7. In Lecture 8, Frodo's failure, the triumph of grace, will look at the climatic moment on Mount Doom, when Frodo is there with the ring, with Gollum, the struggle with Gollum, and what that symbolizes and how it shows the ultimate triumph of grace over evil in The Lord of the Rings. But for this lecture, we're going to look at the author of The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. We're going to look at his life and his beliefs, and how those beliefs inform his work and how those beliefs led to the Lord of the Rings being in Tolkien's own words and I'm quoting the Lord of the Rings is of course a fundamentally religious and Catholic work and in my opinion it's not just a religious and Catholic work it's one of the greatest works of the 20th century perhaps and arguably the greatest work of the 20th century and also, in my judgment, one of the great works of Western civilization, deserving a place beside Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Virgil's Aeneid, Dante's Divine Comedy, as one of the really great works and great achievements of Christian civilization. Now, this is not just my view. It's the view of many, many other people. And indeed, my book, Tolkien, Man and Myth, was inspired by several opinion polls carried out in Britain back in, the in 1997. Um, first of all, Waterstones, a national book selling chain similar to Barnes & Noble, in conjunction with the national TV network, Channel 4, carried out an opinion poll asking the people of Britain what was the greatest work of the 20th century. And in second place was 1984 by George Orwell, but in first place, getting many more votes than Orwell's classic, was The Lord of the Rings. And in two subsequent opinion polls, these results were uh, verified and vindicated, including a poll by the Folio Society, which asked what was the greatest work of all time. 
Uh, and in, in England, in second place, came Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Indeed, a great work, worthy to be second. Uh, but winning, by a considerable margin, was The Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. Now, this delighted me, as I'm sure it delighted many, many other people throughout the UK, but it was treated with horror by many of the literary critics. And it was my reaction to this horror that prompted or provoked me to write my book, Tolkien, Man and Myth. Let me maybe just go over some of the responses. One critic said, rather sarcastically and cynically, that the emergence of the Lord of the Rings as the greatest work of the century just showed the folly of teaching people to read. The famous feminist writer, Germaine Greer, said of the emergence of the Lord of the Rings the following, that ever since my arrival in Cambridge in 1964 to be encountered by a tribe of full-grown women wearing puffed sleeves, clutching teddy bears and babbling on excitedly about the doings of hobbits, it's been my worst fear that the Lord of the Rings should emerge as the greatest work of the 20th century. The bad dream has materialized. Well, you know, Jermaine Greer, with her role in the radical feminist movement in the 1970s, may have her own reasons for not liking the Lord of the Rings, but it was quite clear, clear to me that these critics did not even understand the work they were critiquing. Many of them, perhaps all of them, had never even bothered to read it. There was no engagement with the meaning of the work, with its deepest meaning. And that's what we're going to be trying to do over the next eight lectures, is looking at the deeper meanings of the Lord of the Rings and finding out exactly what it is. And first and foremost, as we need to remember, is in Tolkien's own words, the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Remember, these are the words of Tolkien himself, the author of the work, speaking about the Lord of the Rings, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. So our job in this lecture series will be to look at that work through the eyes of its author, Tolkien, and try to work out why it is that Tolkien is insisting is fundamentally religious and Catholic work.